summer quarter. And to kick things off uh, on a really high note, uh, we have here Dr. Ryder Shell, uh, who, um, if you know a lot about security, you need to know introduction. But to some of you may not know a lot about security, he's going to be a little introduction. Uh, he's been in this field uh, for longer than he probably wants to admit. Um, he has um, worked in the area of being on tiger teams and to learn how to attack systems with great finesse and, and discovered that uh, every system can be hacked unless you make it very well. And so learned, uh, started building highly secure systems uh, that were less vulnerable to uh, penetrators. And uh, he worked here as, as an associate professor uh, and was on the faculty. He was the deputy director of the National uh, Computer Security Center back in Maryland uh, in its startup years and, and got the orange book and all of that going. Um, he was the vice president uh, for engineering at Gemini Computers where class A1 computer systems were constructed. And uh, then he was at Novell responsible for a lot of their security activity. And now he is a um, startup company uh, working in the area of, of computer security. He's done a lot of research and thinking about the public key infrastructure, and that's what he's going to tell us about today. So, Roger, thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you, Cynthia. I uh, appreciate you all coming out in the, uh, for an afternoon session. Uh, I think the... Uh, Public key infrastructure is uh, a, an interesting area. I'll just do a quick survey. How many people uh, think they could define what a public key infrastructure is? <laughs> okay. Yeah, I won't spend much time defining it then. You can tell your buddies. if You know where to go now. See if you can't fi can figure it out. I get some interesting colors here. I guess this is uh, to add pizzazz. I didn't do that. Um, <laughs> The uh, observation in working with uh, major enterprises, and most of what I have to say will come out of the commercial sector because that's where I've been primarily working for the last uh, decade or so, uh, is that uh, the use of a PKI has to be based on uh, trust. And this is something that isn't reflected in much of what is done with PKI today. Unfortunately, the applications of PKI are largely today defined by uh, basically techies who think this is neat technology and apply it. And the business uh, issues are not really that much addressed. So I'll talk a little bit about the business needs and how some of the business people see uh, what's out there today. W one of the things that uh, they th think is important is that there be a uh, pervasive, secure interoperability, as they say. One of the uh, consortiums that I've been part of called the Black Forest Group uh, basically international enterprises, Fortune uh, 50 kind of uh, companies, and they're CIO level people. And as they looked at the question of PKI several years ago, they started to look at that and they said, well, uh, let's take a, a quick study and see what it is we need. Why is this not meeting our needs? And they concluded that they could summarize their needs in those three terms, pervasive, secure, interoperability. The observation was that you could get two out of three or one out of three, but getting all three at the same time is where it's difficult. For interoperability, you need some cohesiveness to the public key infrastructure. Most of what's done today using this class of technology is what they would term as stovepipe solutions, where you have individual organizations solving their problem and ignoring uh, other people's problems. And that essentially does not allow it to be very uh, uh, effective. They also uh, <coughs> observe that there, at the same time, although it needs to be uh, cohesive, it needs to allow for diversity in solutions. This is an area where the uh, vendors have not particularly served business well in most of their view uh, because the vendor's solution is to have you use their product and then uh, uh, the problem is solved. I, uh, a couple years ago, sat on a, a conference panel with uh, several other uh, PKI uh, vendors. And the one vendor, the, the dominant vendor in the industry, kept saying, and of course, uh, we provide complete interoperability and pervasiveness. And so on the panel, 
uh, they had a discussion time in a panel, and I asked him, well, how is it you are interoperable? Well, you interoperate with, with ours, which is standard-based. Well, you know, after some fuzzing around, the answer was basically no. And so then pressed a bit further, well, what do you mean you're interoperable and you're completely compatible? What do you mean? And finally got him to say, because there was nothing else he could say, in a public forum, I mean, I will sell my product to anybody. <laughs> <laughs> And that, unfortunately, is the definition of interoperability and compatibility for, for much of this industry. So that doesn't serve business uh, uh, very well. The other issue to observe is that business is very much concerned about liability. And the question is, who is liable for the actions that are taken when you're using a PKI? This turns out to, I think, be the hardest problem that they have to face. And in particular, you use a certificate, a digital certificate, to make some representation. And the question is, if that representation turns out not to be true, and you take an action based on that representation, who is liable? How can you make it uh, so that it can be accepted by the person who takes the representation? That's, uh, uh, those are the needs which business thinks th they have. Now, they say there are three capabilities that you require in a PKI in order to m meet those needs. And this Black Forest Group, the BFG that I mentioned as a consortium, they put together a working group on electronic commerce. And uh, they went off and they said, well, what is all the things we need in a PKI? And uh, they came back with a list of about 50 things. And of course, several of the managers observed, you know, I can't do anything with a list of 50 things. So you're going to meet all my requirements with a list of 50. What can I do with that? That's just not useful to me. So they redefined their goal, and they said, well, if I, is there some sort of cutoff where I could meet most of my needs with a much shorter set? And their conclusion was, yes, I could meet you know, their estimate about 90% of the needs for a PKI if I had, could meet three of those 50. And these are the three things that they say, if I can have these three capabilities, in my public key infrastructure, I can meet 90% of the needs. Now, it says that the various kind of techie advocates can go find a, a limit case out there in that 10% and say, well, what about this, this, and this? And you say, you're right, can't do that. That happens not to be the most important things uh, to business. The most important by far is a question of what they call uh, liability allocation. If I end up with a chain of certificates, which are typically the, the kind of use uh, of certificates, how can I allocate liability to the various people that participated in creating and dispensing those certificates? Today, there is no mechanism for having that kind of uh, liability. Business has a simple need in terms of what they want to have happen. They want to, as a business, limit their liability to the actions which they take. So consequently, if they buy uh, some PKI software and hardware and they put it on their floor and they take uh, some actions and they create a certificate and make some representation, they send it to somebody and it turns out that say the platform they built that on was hacked. And so somebody creates a bogus certificate in their name because the platform is hacked. They'd say, yeah, I didn't do that. I shouldn't be liable for that uh, bad platform. And maybe, uh, if I have to be liable, what I need to do is get insurance. And one of the members of the Black Forest Group was a, a, a major, was the director of a major auto industry activity. It was called the Automotive Network Exchange, ANX, which was a PKI-based exchange for uh, meeting auto industry needs. And they had a financial motivation for doing it. They did a study in the auto industry and they concluded that they would save $1 billion a year if they could make that work. Yeah. Billion dollars a year. And all they needed was a secure and reliable internet. And reliable they could get. They could buy that from the, the common carriers, not a problem. Secure PKI was going to provide for them, they thought. That's where they started. Along the way, they finally came and they had talked to insurance and financial people and they said, okay, we got this problem solved, uh, just give us tra uh, insurance on the tra transaction. So if I make a $100,000 transaction that goes wrong because the technology failed, uh, you'll hold me harmless. And as they tell the story, they say, when the laughter died down, they said, no, you can't buy that kind of insurance. It's not available. Why is that the case? Well, one of the major insurance companies 
has a policy after a certain experience, which they won't uh, uh, bother to uh, say much about. And their policy is they will not underwrite any policy which they would have to make a payment because of a failure of Windows NT. And that lost a lot of business for them. But as one of their senior people said to me, we're in the business of write, writing insurance. We love to write insurance, but we don't like to lose money. And so <clears throat> they, the result was that today you can't buy that kind of insurance that is insuring against the sort of platform failure. So on the PKI, the question of how the, the business faces is how can I have liability allocated to different people in a chain when I've got somebody like Microsoft that is, can cause me damage and I can't get recovery from them. So that's our most important issue is how do I get uh, the liability allocation uh, handled reasonably. The second requirement they have is uh, what they call distributed validation. And what that says is that for many of their applications, they need to be able to determine the validity and use of a certificate when I got the certificate chain and not have to go elsewhere. One of the uh, major businesses in electronic uh, data exchange for uh, financial institutions uh, was asked to actually sign up a contract to make themselves compatible with the world's leading PKI vendor in terms of having it PKI enabled. What they didn't understand when they signed up for this contract was that as they looked, lifted up the covers and they said, what do we have to do to really make this work in order to actually accept a certificate? They had to, on a network, had five different IP connections open at that time, every time they got a certificate chain, in order to say whether or not I will accept the certificate chain if it had significant liability. That's five points of failure. And if they were in an environment where their security policy says, and I don't want to have lots of network connections to the whole wide world out there, they had no way to do that because those IP connections were to lots of other things outside. So they said, for many of our needs, we need to be able to get the certificate chain and make a decision now as to what this is good for and know what our risks are in doing that. So that's what they mean by distributed liability or validation. They can validate on a distributed basis without having to go to some centralized kind of uh, service. Their last requirement uh, was user accountability. Now, what does that mean? Why do they say that? That meant that the techies were trying to get, sell them things in which they had programs making decisions, be they uh, what would today be called agents or whatever you want to have. And from business's point of view, that's a total non-starter. As they would say, <coughs> I, can't, uh, I can't sue a piece of software. If I put it in jail, it doesn't do me any good. If I fire it, I haven't done it, I haven't accomplished it. They don't have the properties of people. And by user, they mean person. In business, you have to have some person who's accountable for the action. And that person cannot have that accountability lie to hardware and software. And they said many of the solutions they see out there, in fact, tries to make software responsible for the action. Can't happen. So if they looked at the products that are out there and say, well, how do the products match up? The answer is they fall short. In what way? Well, the first problem that they face is what's called distorted intermediary uh, liability. What that says, you've got these intermediaries that are in a process and they distort the liability. Uh, this happens in, in one of two ways. The one way that you're perhaps familiar with is a common model when you use your browser on the internet and you go out and you uh, go to some secured site and you get the padlock to close. What that means is there's a certificate that's been issued. And many of those certificates, the dominant certificate issue is VeriSign in the US. Now, in Europe, they refer to this as the VeriSign problem. Now, why do they call it the VeriSign problem? Well, the reason is the VeriSign business model is basically that VeriSign <coughs> gets money from you for every certificate that they issue. And so they issue all the certificates, them or their agents. But what is their liability for issuing an improper certificate? Basically none. Some of you may have noticed within the last several months uh, that they issued a bogus certificate for, on behalf of Microsoft. And this was papered over fairly nicely in terms of, oh, well, this isn't really a problem at all. From a business point of view, oh, well, that really is a problem. 
And that particular incident didn't expose the full nature of the problem, but the major enterprises understand, as somebody said, <coughs> my transactions I protect with a PKI in an hour are more than I ever expect the total net worth of VeriSign to be. How in the world can I be betting my business on the behavior of this company VeriSign and what the actions they will take when they can cause me massive failure and I couldn't possibly have recourse to them. They just don't have the, the deep pockets to, to deal with it. So the, the question, that one solution that says, oh, I've got a big CA in the sky someplace that's issuing all the certificates is always going to fail because there is no big CA in the sky that can issue all the certificates in the world. It's a distributed world. And you know, so if I'm looking in the DOD or the federal PKI, the question is, am I willing to accept VeriSign as the ultimate authority for certificates that are going to handle uh, intelligence data, for example? Probably not. And so there just doesn't exist that thing. So the solution that some people have is, oh, well, we're going to uh, cross-certify. And so you'll see these terms of a bridge certificate authority or a cross-certification. All of this sort of thing is about agreeing to accept a certificate that somebody else has provided. I found that the federal PKI activities over the last several years interesting in that several years ago when I was at Novell, we had pointed out some of the challenges in this space of dealing with uh, bridge CAs. And they had bridge CAs as their solution. Oh, no, we're going to take care of that. That's fine. Well, it has now been somewhat deployed. And you can read in the public uh, places the uh, certificate policy for the bridge CAs. And what you will observe, they say very clearly, the bridge CA has zero liability for the actions which they take. Zero. Contrary to what they had told the industry people earlier on. Now, why is that the case? It had to come down with that answer. That's why industry said, we know where you're headed. And they said, no, 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 we're going to take The answer is, nobody's going to sign a contract that's going to make them liable for cross-certifying or maybe the bridge CA for somebody else's certificates without any basis for, for doing that to where they can have recourse. It isn't going to happen. And so that's the thing that the processes today, the solutions that are offered are fine techie solutions. You can draw the pictures on the diagram. You can teach how it all is going to work together. And syntactically, it works fine. It'll give you the answer. Semantically, in terms of liability, it doesn't work at all. And so that's their first problem of, of the products today. They don't solve that problem. And the question of how you handle uh, certificate policies. There is no reasonable way. Today, the primary policy processing mechanism is you have some unique ID called no ID that goes in a certificate that indicates something that's out there written about in some other place. Now I get, and an OID may represent something like a VeriSign certificate policy that runs to you know, dozens, if not hundreds, of pages long. So now I've got a certificate. It's got some OID in it. What does that tell me about whether or not I should accept this certificate or not? Not very much. And furthermore, the problem is that they tend not to even reflect the composite of the, of the whole chain. In terms of certificates, when you have one certificate referring to another to another, the question is, which certificate is it I should determine for, for my policy? There's really only one commonly used field in certificates today in the common standards that are, that are uh, cumulative or have a composite, and that's expiration date. If any certificate along the chain is expired, the whole certificate is expired. Virtually no other policy implementation mechanisms have that property, that if something along the chain is bad, then it's all bad. Just isn't there. So there, none of the proposed schemes, including most of the popular standards, deal effectively with that question of processing policies. And of course, uh, they tend to be complex to manage. I mentioned the five IP addresses. Uh, and they deal with a problem, their hard problem, the dirty one that they sweep under the rug and don't want to talk about. I mentioned earlier the vulnerabilities of the underlying platform, in which you have strong cryptography built on a foundation of sand. I mean, it is, you know, people sometimes are astounded as they look at a business sense. People out arguing about whether a certificate needs to have a 1024 or 2048 bit key because it's a matter of whether it's going to last, you know, be valid for 100 years or, or a million years. When they're running on platforms <coughs> that, you know, you could take a, uh, and get attacked for you know, a mere million dollars or something. I've observed that if somebody could suspend the legal prosecution, I'd be happy to take a million dollar contract to issue a VeriSign certificate 
uh, for anybody that says absolutely anything on it. Tell me what VeriSign certificate you'd like to have. I'll take a fixed price contract to get you a VeriSign certificate of your choice for a million dollars, and I'm going to make a lot of money. And so if you don't believe that you have things worth a million dollars, you're probably okay. But if you believe, as businesses do, that they have things that are worth uh, hundreds of millions of dollars, that's not a very comforting uh, kind of solution. And so the underlying platform is sort of the, <clears throat> the dirty secret that we computer scientists don't talk about. We like to talk about the, uh, the, all the PKI wonders. So um, next I want to talk about uh, three uh, capabilities that are important to providing the solutions. One is uh, a, a route for providing the interactions. One is having explicit uh, quality in the certificates. And the third is the question of hardened platforms. So I will go through those uh, in order. The notion of a liability assuming route is that, yes, if you're going to have uh, interoperability, you have to have a common route. The VeriSign model in that respect is right. The, now, if you have your common browser, what you have in your browser is a typically order of 50 or 60 routes, if you were to look. And that says there are 50 or 60 different CAs in the world that can issue certificates, and your browser is going to accept all of them as va valid unless you've done something to change. One of those, or several of them actually, will be VeriSign. So if you're going to, however, have somebody that's going to serve as a route for lots of different activities, you have to have what the business people tend to call the liability assuming route. That's to distinguish it from VeriSign's route. And uh, it assumes no liability. And <clears throat> that is something which can essentially be issued offline, which provides the common basis for uh, interoperability. It is the root of all certificate chains within your uh, uh, domain uh, of interest. There may actually be several, you know, as people say, a few routes, but not you know, every business having their own. Now, the <clears throat> that uh, route then has to be one which can be distributed and be there on a highly uh, reliable basis. One of the myths about PKI is since it's a public key, it doesn't matter about that public key certificate, which of the root is just a public key certificate. Well, what that means is consider the problem of your browser. You use your browser, and any of the 50 routes that are in it are fine. Now, if I want to get you to accept my certificate so that when you go to uh, J period, C period, pennies instead of JC pennies, that you will uh, <coughs> give me your credit card and everything else and send me your money, well, how do I get you to accept my certificate? Well, I have to have my root in your browser. Now, if you've, over the past year, you may have noticed if you were running on older uh, browsers, you got a little notice that says, oh, your certificate's about to ex expire. Would you like to update your certificate? You click a little thing and your certificate's updated. No sweat, right? Remember some of you seeing that message? What that illustrates is that adding another certificate into your browser is something that's very fully enabled and made very easy to happen. And so you know, what I do is I have to have you, you know, you come to my site and I get you to interact with me and accept one of my uh, <coughs> free offers and I install a new route uh, in your browser and uh, uh, away you go. And now uh, you will accept uh, all my certificates. So what you need to have is a route that you can give with high integrity. How are you going to get high integrity for the root? Because although it's public, it's not secret. You want to make sure you're using the right one. About the only way you're going to be able to do that is to put it in hardware. One of the reasons there needs to be a few roots is it's hard to put it in hardware and change it all the time from a, a business point of view. So there is something called the TCPA, the Trusted Computer Platform Alliance, which is the major vendors to, of PCs to businesses. And they've agreed that if a, a a root exists as a common uh, root that they can put that easily in the hardware of every platform that is sold out there uh, that goes to business. And what you can expect to see within the next year or so is uh, when you buy a business computer, it won't happen for individuals, it'll say TCPA compliant. There's a specification that says what that means. So that hardware becomes an important way of enforcing that aspect. Now, in terms of the hierarchy, when you, by hierarchy, I mean you've got a chain of certificates. And you've got some relationship that exists in that chain, typically. Well, one of the things that a business believes is that that needs to reflect the distributed nature of what's going on. There is no king 
uh, <coughs> that is going to issue all the certificates. The world can't just run on VeriSign certificates. And as they looked at this question in the Black Forest Group, their conclusion was that there had to be four levels into this hierarchy as a minimum in order to satisfy business needs. It has nothing to do with technology. It has only to do with the way business is done. It was sort of interesting that about a year and a half after the Black Forest Group had done their original look at this, one of the major banking organizations um, <coughs> uh, had gone out and uh, had established their own consortium for PKI. And as they looked down that, Identrust is the name of the organization. If you looked at that Identrust, they indeed had four levels in their hierarchy for basically the same reasons. And if you went and you looked at the credit card uh, activity in terms of this, the set processing uh, for that, even though that protocol may not be alive and well, the, the basic uh, <coughs> uh, uh, structure of the PKI is reasonable and has uh, basically four levels in terms of it. So for various sort of independent looks, you conclude that there's probably going to be four levels in the hierarchy to meet uh, business needs. Now, you say, well, why would anyone care? It's just certificates in a chain. If you're a vendor of this kind of product, you care a lot. Because if you've got one, like VeriSign, selling all the certificates, if the hierarchy's one and you're the dominant leader, you've got a good business model. If you now let people run certificates below your certificates and have a hierarchy of four levels, that means other people may be able to come into those other levels. And that's a threat to you business-wise. And so as you sort of expose this kind of thing <coughs> where you have levels other than the given organization, everybody says, it's my organization. I'm going to have my level. Whether I'm the federal PKI, I'm going to have mine, and I'm going to have it. Or whether I'm Verisign, I'm going to have mine, and I'm going to have it. And as long as you've got that parochial point of view, there's a basically a tension between that and having an inter, a PKI that can work in an in, interoperable business kind of world. So these four levels were one of the things that they, that's going to be the case. But it needs to allow for a way of having diversity in that everybody isn't going to use the same software or have the same business liabilities. And you need to be able to let a customer choose what the components are that are going to be in a chain. And those are painful decisions if you're trying to preserve some proprietary uh, sort of advantage in terms of your PKI arena. And that's where we are today in terms of products. So what does that hierarchy look like? Well, the PKI hierarchy that came out of the uh, Black Forest Group starts out with a view that says, well, you have sort of the common view. You're going to have, say, a DOD uh, PKI. And what it's going to do is it's going to be responsible for issuing certificates to its individual users and agents and web servers and whatever it is uh, the certificates are used for. And that's, that's fine. That's sort of the typical uh, way. Now, the problem is, well, you want to have more than just DOD. So say you want to have a federal PKI, and you want DOD to be part of that uh, federal PKI. Well, OK, what do you seem to need? Well, you need somebody else who's going to issue a certificate to your certificate issuer. Well, technically, that's not a, a major problem. The question of what the business liabilities are are sort of the questions you have to start asking. This is something that has been referred to as a registry. That level, which is, has other levels under it, is called a registry. The bottom level you could call a, of CAs, you could call an enterprise. It's issuing the certificates. And they issue certificates for, I'll call them users. You know, in computer science, you might call them principals. And <coughs> that works fine. Uh, and now you say, well, all right, this is OK as long as we have a common point of management. And so the federal government and the, and the uh, DOD said, yeah, we're all under the executive branch. And so you know, that's, that's all there. We have got a common uh, point of management. We can, we can claim that that works. Now what do you happens when you want to interact with industry? And so say you want to go to the banking community. Hmm. Now, where is the common point of, uh, of representation? Well, you know, if you get a little flip about it, you say in the US, well, it's a Federal Reserve. That's what, no, no problem. And now you want to go to France or Russia, and you don't get the same response in terms of you can't communicate on an international basis with the banking community unless you have some place that they can you know, respect between them. And how are you going to get that? Well, it's going to require 
some sort of root. And it has to be a liability assuming root because clearly you can suffer damage if they can issue bogus certificates out of that root. And you may say to me, but you just told me that the VeriSign model is broken, that I can't have one roots that's issuing all the certificates. So what are you telling me? That yeah, you gotta have w one root, but, but the VeriSign model doesn't work? What's going on here? Well, let's look at what the liability is for those four levels, because that's what the issue is about. What is the, the liability? Look at what the liability assuming root has to do. It has to protect its private key, because if you can compromise a private key, you can abuse it and you can issue bogus certificates. That's sort of the, the primary thing you're trying to protect. What else does it have to do? Well, it has to ensure that it has a unique identity for each one of the registries under it. Clearly, I can't give the same name to two different <coughs> items or else I've got confusion. And what are other things that? Well, the main one is it has to have deep pockets in terms of recovery. Now, so the business people, since these were business people, they sat around and they said, look, what does deep pockets mean? It was interesting to watch a lot of different industries, petroleum, uh, <coughs> healthcare, automotive, uh, chemicals, the sort of representatives in uh, this consortium. And they all came pretty quickly to the answer that they, we know what people are gonna try and sell us and we know what doesn't make it. A hundred million dollars is chump change. And everybody who wants to serve as a root, and indeed I've encountered a number of these, yeah, we'll give you $100 million of coverage. That's not deep pockets in a business sense. Remember that the automotive industry figured that they could save a, just save a billion dollars. Just their savings. Now, that's got many other billions of dollars that are going along as the transactions under that. $100 million is not it. So their sort of conclusion, what are we talking about? Well, it isn't a precise number, it's not a precise process. But basically the number is $100 billion. So if you say, what do you have to be to have a liability assuming you're, you've got to accept liability and provide recourse for $100 billion. Now, what that's gonna to tend to tell you is it's basically gonna be in a financial uh, <coughs> uh, institution because you know the banks, as Willie Sutton said, is he, somebody asked him, why do you rob banks? He said, that's where the money is. Well, you know, that's basically the story. Banks are where the money is. And so it's gonna be in that financial uh, community. It has some other properties in terms of the banking community, and that is that it does have international recognition. And indeed, there are, as I mentioned, uh, Identrust and the set route, those routes exist today across internationally dealing with financial assets. And indeed, if you look at it, their liability is in the order of $100 billion. So that's already recognized. Now, well, what's the problem with VeriSign uh, accepting $100 billion liability? Well, obviously they don't have $100 billion. Well, what's the problem with the banking route issuing all the certificates? They're not gonna be liable for all the transactions, all the things that happen with every certificate for all the things that go on the certificate. So the key thing to the liability is, assuming route is that it just has to do two things. It's only liable for two failures. It's liable if their key is, private key is compromised. It's liable if it produces duplicate IDs uh, for registries. And if it doesn't do two things, those two things, they can't cause t damage to the people below them and they're not liable. And so it's this distributed nature that says, yeah, you can give the, you can distribute to the root a different set of liabilities than what you give to the registry. What do you want the registry to be able to do? See, they say the federal PKI route. Well, they have to protect their private key, but the one thing that they uniquely have to do that the route didn't have to is they have to confirm the identities of the enterprises that are below them. They have to know that the DOD is the DOD and that the CIA is the CIA and that they have the difference and that they can make that a, a company. The route doesn't have to know that. The thing about the VeriSign model is there's no way that the route can know that. What was VeriSign's problem in the Microsoft certificate? They issued a certificate that claimed to be Microsoft that really wasn't Microsoft. It wasn't that it didn't uniquely identify an entity. It was that it wasn't Microsoft. They didn't know the identity. And indeed, and for much of business, banks are already in the business of knowing the identity of their major customers. The banks know who GM is. And so that's something that a registry can 
uh, serve and can probably use a banking institution to, to, to provide its uh, constraints or its capability. The other thing that a registry can do is when it issues a certificate to a given organization, it can impose constraints. It says, I'm giving you this certificate, but for example, this certificate is not good for, if I'm issuing a certificate uh, <clears throat> to Health and Human Services, I might want to, at the federal PKI, indicate that this certificate is not valid for providing clearances for SCI material. And so, I get, and so even if they might later claim that they was part of their capabilities, this certificate constrains what it is they can do. Because, remember, the philosophy is that the effect of the certificate is accumulative. It's no better than its weakest link. So if I made it weak at one point in terms of the capabilities, and so I can constrain subordinate enterprises. It turns out in dealing with uh, one of the uh, major customers I deal with is an uh, insurance conglomerate who has 45 major business units in the United States. And one of the things that they observe is that some of their major business units are what they would call cowboys with regard to uh, security properties. They're not willing to trust them for a lot of things, but they bought these companies and they, they live with them. This gives them the ability to essentially put a constraint on those people, and when they, issue, when they have a registry issue, a certificate for one of those things, you can only do certain things. And you're, not, and you're constrained. No matter what you claim in your certificate, it's not going to be recognized w with that sort of constraint. Enterprises, of course, what do they have to do? Well, they protect their key, and they confirm the identities of their users, and they impose constraints on the users, things like signing limits, financial signing limits. And they can say, this certificate that I give to Tim is only good for $50 because that's all I'm willing to trust uh, Tim for uh, signing. That's all it's good for. And those kind of constraints can be composed, imposed by uh, uh, the enterprises. So when you look at it, it isn't as foolish as it appeared at first when I said, yeah, you've got to have a root. And yes, that root has to have, be liability assuming. It's only liable for its actions. And so this kind of distributed liability is the thing that makes it work. I don't try and have any king in the sky that's going to be responsible for all the things. And that is something that they believe is a workable structure. Now. The thing I've talked about sort of in passing is that every certificate needs to have something that tells me what that certificate is good for. Now, I've got several slides about this. I won't go over it in, in detail, but I want to give you a flavor for what that kind of, of issue is about. Because now we say, OK, assume I have this hierarchy. Still, what does it tell me about what the certificate is good for? I want to have distributed validation. I've got the certificate chain. So it came. It has four certificates in my certificate chain. How do I know what this certificate is good for? How do I process that in, a, in an effective way? Well, the problem is that you really have a wide diversity of certificate qualities. If you look at the VeriSign certificates, for example, they have, I believe, four different classes of certificates. And you've got user certificates, which you can buy for $25 or whatever the current rate is as an individual to give you a certificate. And essentially, they say, what, is, what does it represent? It represents that somebody had an email address and sent an email to VeriSign and said, I want to buy a certificate and send them $25. And you got it. And that's, th that's the lowest class certificate. Not very much in terms of, uh, of quality. If you have a <clears throat> server and you're trying to be one of the people that you get your padlock to close, well, VeriSign will s and does sign, sell lots of those certificates. They sell them at, used to sell them at $400. The price went up this year. I forget what the new price is. For $400, you get a certificate for one server for one year. And if you're a major business which has, lots of, has a server farm, and you plan to operate more than a year, assuming you're not a dot-com, um, <coughs> then uh, <coughs> you're going to have to be putting out money for these kind of certificates. And so that's a different quality. Now, that's the sort of certificate, of course, that Microsoft was getting issued. And you know, we understand from experience just what's told us you know, what, uh, what that certificate's good. Not the highest quality, but different than the one that says, I just have an email address. So the solution that comes out of this uh, BFG framework is the notion of an explicit attribute in every certificate that tells you something about the certificate. Now, the existing dominant standard, the, the uh, X509 version 3 standards, allow for those kind uh, of attributes. The attribute has a property that is cumulative across the chain so that it's no better than uh, the weakest one. So if, for example, I want to have a, a, an organization that has people with, and I don't want anybody out of that, or, I don't want that organization issuing certificates that's good for more than $1,000 to anybody. 
I can at the registry level, I can say this certificate has a thousand dollar signing limit. And no matter what certificates, they give Cynthia one that says you're good for a million dollars. I take through the chain and I go through the registry. That's the minimum. That isn't good for more than a thousand dollars, even though the certificate on the face of it says it's a million dollar certificate. And so <clears throat> I also want to recognize this dirty little problem that we computer scientists have about the vulnerability of platforms. I want to recognize in it what is the quality of the platform that this was minted on. I want to be explicit about that. Now, so if I'm going to produce a certificate, what happens when I'm going to produce a certificate? Well, mainly I have to have whoever is business-wise responsible for specifying what goes into quality attribute. They have to have a way of reliably specifying and getting that into the certificate. In other words, my certificate authorities have to have the ability to populate a quality attribute in a, in a known and reliable way. And you have to have a way of guaranteeing that that specification. Well, it turns out, what's the best way to sort of guarantee that if you have something like registration authorities as they call it? Well, you might consider using a PKI as a way of validating the thing. And so you can use the same mechanism to validate uh, those requests. Now, when you're going to consume the certificate, well, what do you have to have? In order to take a certificate chain, well, I have to have the root certificate. And I have to know that that certificate that got issued down the chain was issued by validly down the chain. But that's the normal PKI processing does that. That's what the certificate, the signatures tell me, is that it's valid down the chain. And that allows me to locally decide whether this certificate is what it is good for. Notice that this is very different than the model of some of the academic views. If you were to go to the IETF and participate in some of the PKX working group that's out that's responsible for standards, there's a very strong social tendency there to have the notion that says, you know, there's only <coughs> one Cynthia. And all she needs is one certificate to say there's one Cynthia. And that that's all we need to have. And that's what we ought to be in the world. The PGP model is sort of that not model. That you've got a PGP certificate, and I know that Cynthia is Cynthia, and that's all there is. And that's a very strong social bias out of that standards community. <coughs> However, that says that you really you just you either it's binary. You either accept the certificate or you don't. That's all you have. If you have the quality attribute, you then here's a certificate chain, and General Motors might choose to accept the certificate chain, and Ford might not choose to exactly the same certificate chain. So it isn't like you have to have it's sort of a middle ground. It isn't one certificate does everything, and it isn't a separate certificate for every purpose. It's a certificate that has a quality attribute in it that lets the relying party decide what it is good for. Now. What are the sort of components that have uh, come about in terms of this? Well, it turns out that the Black Forest Group said, we're not a standards body. We get, need to decide what's going to be in these components. We're going to go pick one. And they looked at what Novell had done previously for their own use, and they said, we'll use that. So what basically makes up the, the quality attribute? Well, a couple of things are non-infrastructure. The three that matter that we'll mostly look at are the key quality, certificate quality, and something called the label. Now, what does a key quality mean? It says, when I generate the private key, it's in there. what's the confidentiality of that private key? What's the confidence I have that somebody else doesn't know that private key? Remember, the, all levels of the hierarchy were liable for protecting the private key. So that has to be uh, there. And one of, uh, one of the ways of reflecting that, we'll see a bit later, will relate to the platform it's on. Certificate quality, this is what in the computer science world, and particularly security, we would call a trusted path. And that says, what is the confidence that the contents of this certificate reflects what some person, basically, individual accountability, said, that's what I wanted to be? Is the are the bits in the certificate what the person thought they saw? That's the certificate quality. And how do, what are the factors that go into that? Well, the major factors are, one is the uh, strength, the assurance of the platform that is generated on. And in terms of the crypto, what is the quality of the crypto implementation? There are other factors, but that's the, the primary uh, factor. In terms of the label, this is what provides the constraints on what it is that can uh, be done with a certificate. And that label has three identical components, which reflect uh, the user's component, the enterprise component, and the registry component. Each of those have a, a label, and each one of those labels has something that would, do, when I talk to a DOD audience, I have to, much less to say about it. This is basically what you would call a, a classification or a clearance. This is a, a label. The reason a level, hierarchical, there's two. 
for uh, <coughs> integrity and secrecy. And this is a set of compartments that you have that you essentially a bit string. And this is a way of having a sparsely populated bit spring just from the standpoint of efficiency. Very common kind of, of label. This is what uh, multi-level secure systems have used these sort of labels for a decade or so. If you were looking like people like DEC, uh, they had that. Now, if I look at then what I do with a chain, well, what am I going to do? Well, it's what I'd expect. I take the greatest lower bound of all the key qualities, and I say I end up with a composite certificate. And what that composite says is that the quality, key quality is the least of any of the key qualities. Similarly, in terms of the constraints, I do essentially an AND of all the operations, and I end up with a composite that says, and what do I do? I compare that to what we call a validation profile that says that's what's good enough. And the validation profiles are essentially defined by administrators. So if your administrator wants to say, I'm willing to connect to websites that have this property, I define a validation profile for that. And now that defines what I'm willing to accept. I didn't have to go and reissue all the certificates. And if I change my criteria, I simply change my validation profile, my distributed validation here. I don't have to go out and reissue all the certificates. The validation process, of course, occurs uh, at the endpoint. And once again, I'll just note that the a key security issue is how do I get a high integrity copy of the root where this starts? And that's basically uh, because I'm going to uh, put that in hardware where I care. Now, how do I use this? Well, I'm going to start with some certificate chain. I've got my root, my registry, uh, say, my, uh, say an insurance company. They're going to have various places that get various applications that get certificates issued to them, SMIME, et cetera. And what am I going to do? I'm going to have a copy of that root. The root certificate is going to go, say, in the SMIME. In fact, it's going to go in all those applications as my high integrity root. And notes that's all I had to do to configure it. The rest, I'm going to have a validation profile that each application is going to decide what they need, but I don't have to engage in a major configuration activity. Now, we've mentioned about the, uh, <clears throat> the problem of the platform. Well, I won't. Uh, since you uh, have been introduced, I think, to the security issues of, of platforms, and Cynthia is an expert on that. She can tell you more. Uh, just to note that you know, typical platforms, the trapdoors and Trojan horses and other uh, malicious software are easy ways to subvert most of any of the common platforms that are out there. It's a good reason why the insurance company won't issue an insurance policy for NT. Very good reason. You have no recourse, and they're not particularly sound. So does that mean we can't have PKIs? No. It means that what we want to have is platforms that have an independent third party evaluation. And what is a good enough evaluation? What do I require? Well, from the business point of view, it turns out the, require, the need is not that different than what the DOD had some 15 or so years ago. They faced the problem of buying what they considered what today would be called a VPN. And how do I get a secure VPN, and particularly if I'm going to buy the platform for the VPN, potentially from the KGB? And they have the problem of how do I provide a sufficient set of criteria that I'd be willing to buy this platform, hardware and software, software in particular, from the KGB, and be able to deploy it to protect the most sensitive secrets that I have in a VPN. That's roughly the problem which business has. The good news to business is that problem has been solved. DOD did, in fact, buy a commercial operating system, which was used to provide a VPN called Blacker, which was used to transmit it over the internet, and was used for you know, a decade or so, and used with the most sensitive secrets of the US and Canada, and also used in the UK. And they did that because they had a criteria, and the US, European environment had a criteria that allowed them to say, good enough. What was that criteria? The definition of what essentially would go into an A1 criteria was exactly that. That was the level at which it says, I'd be willing to buy this from the KGB. The comparable European standard is the E6FB3. So that's not an unsolved problem. It's actually been built and, and delivered, and the technology exists, but you can't buy such a PKI today from an industry point of view. So what does it mean from the standpoint of somebody trying to provide a PKI you can trust? Well, you're going to have to modify the products. You're going to have to create the quality attribute, you're validated, and you have to restructure it so it works on a high assurance platform. It's interesting that of the three top 
PKI vendors, one of the three major vendors has, within the last six months, modified their standard product to put the quality attribute and to validate the quality attribute uh, in their standard and have that in their next release of their standard offering. So they've understood that. You might expect it was the least of the three because the number one leader was no way, no how interested because they could only lose business by doing that. So it's still, you, know, you get the, the bottom tier and they're the ones who want to increase their market share. <clears throat> the issue of a liability assuming root, as I mentioned, set and identity to bank community are existing routes, but they're not available generally for use in a PKI. That bridge has not been made. Identris in particular says they'd be happy to move down that point of view when they find an interest in terms of the uh, customer community. Interestingly enough, <clears throat> when we began to talk to the Identris people, guess what they gave as their first example of why it isn't needed? The DOD PKI represents <clears throat> many, many thousands of certificates and they don't need it. We've talked to them, we've talked to them about it, they don't need it, they're not using it, and consequently, obviously, this isn't needed. The first example they gave me was the DOD PKI as an example of why people didn't need it. Now, I agree that the DOD PKI isn't using it. The question of how they are addressing some of the issues we've talked about is one which, uh, in your, who knows, in your careers, you may have the opportunity to look at that question. And in order to enable the value-related transactions that they're concerned about, they need to be able to have what could potentially be an insurable platform to change this practice uh, of insurance companies. And that's basically all it takes to create a PKI that you can trust. So that was the question, and uh, that's what we've seen. So appreciate your attention. I've uh, used my time, and I uh, now give back to uh, Cynthia. Yes. Yes. I have been uh, aware that a lot of the insurance companies have in, been increasing their uh, policy coverages for, for IT type uh, products in, in the workplace. Uh, is what you're saying a reversal of that? No, not at all. What, what it says is that the, uh, as we note, insurance companies like to write insurance. And so they've been working very hard. Whenever you get cons uh, consumers that are concerned about something, like hackers, what you're going to rush out and do is you're going to write policies that you're not going to lose money on. And so what they do is they write policies for things like continuity of service and things like that, which have very bounded liabilities. What you can't get from an insurance company is something that if you have, say, a financial transaction, that they will insure you for the amount of the transaction that you're putting into the individual with each certificate. That's what you can't buy. In other words, you can't buy anything that's worth very much. But you can buy things that may help you feel good. And so, and they're very heavily selling that feel good security because they actually make a lot of money uh, selling that because people are just sort of scared about security. And so they'll go out and pay the big bucks for the policy and they rarely pay. It was a different kind of policy. Did you see that as a driver for increasing the overall security costs in the marketplace? That will depend upon what the customers do. As long as, you know, the response I got from Adentrust about if the DOD PKI isn't, doesn't need this, we don't believe anybody needs it. Uh, as long as the people like the DOD PKI say we don't care about any of these issues, then that isn't going to drive the products in the marketplace. It's going to be driven by what people pay for. It is interesting to note that in the last uh, two weeks there have been several statements uh, by at least the government officials uh, pointing out that the well, as one of the people, but Senator Bennett uh, said, the hackers are just a nuisance. And he's right. They are not professionals at all. Having been on a Tiger team, I would observe that they're very amateurish uh, and that the professionals that are going to go after you are the ones that are probably taking you, you don't know it, and you're not likely uh, to get caught. And he observed that state-sponsored and uh, uh, activities or organized crime or those sort of things are where the professionals are. Very different motivation than you have for the hackers. The hackers want to be, have it known that they've accomplished it. They want to expose it. Uh, if I get you as a professional, the last thing I want you to know is to, that you've been done. So are there charges to saying one million users can't be wrong? That's right. 
They're saying a, a million users can't be wrong. Uh, and in particular, you know, they, they do hold, uh, like it or not, uh, they regard the, the DOD, which includes the NSA and such, as sort of the paranoids of the world. And so they're saying if these people aren't worried about it, then there's no reason why we ought to worry about it. So it isn't just the million users. It's who they are. These are the people that, in fact, were responsible for establishing the National Computer Security Center, the people that represent the U.S. as a government in international bodies with regard to standardization and security. So that's why they pick out the, the DOD, not just because it's a million users, but because they are sort of have you know, promoted themselves successfully as the leaders in information security. Yeah. Roger, is the, uh, the calculation of this cumulative quality attribute yes. that, and, and the comparison to the desired profile, that happens on the user's end system? Yes. And so for that to happen with high assurance, does that mean I have to put a high assurance system on, on the user's desktop? Yeah. So uh, this is a matter that uh, the question of the insurance of the desktop is one where many businesses observe that because of the liability, in other words, the loss you could suffer from any single desktop is relatively small, that probably the desktop is the last place to deal with the assurance issue, just from a business point of view. Whereas if I have a failure at, say, an enterprise issuing certificates, that can cost me big bucks. So it's driven by the business application. But if you had something like a banking thing that is responsible for banks, for example, for years have used these message authentication codes, crypto, and they've got special boxes, those special boxes in this paradigm would probably be on a high assurance. 